So I have um, an ongoing issue, uh, an ongoing interest in moulds and things as well. So I was putting this talk together yesterday, and, it, and it, well, I really realised that there's not actually that much really solid information out there. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, and people have views and opinions about things, but the real science in this area is a bit scant, actually. So I'm going to give you what I consider to be the best science um, at the moment, but um, you know, bear in mind that you may hear other things from other people, and these ideas can also change over time as more science becomes available. So I'd love to keep this as informal as possible, so please feel free to stop me and ask questions at any time. Um, just really happy to, to explain things as I go along. Um, I guess I'm used to talking to undergraduates, people with not necessarily a lot of scientific background, so hopefully I'm not pitching it um, at too high a level, but you know, just let me know if, um, if you're having any difficulties understanding what I'm saying, or if you'd like anything explained a bit more thoroughly. So I thought I'd start just telling you a little bit about fungi. So I don't know if any of you know much about the fungal kingdom, which is a large kingdom of life in the world. Um, for example, you may have seen these things, and you probably know that mushrooms and toadstools are fungi, and you may have seen mold on your bread, and you probably know that's fungi too, or yeast uh, that makes our bread and our beer. Uh, those are all fungal organisms that do those things. But something to bear in mind is that most organisms really have a, mi a microscopic phase. So molds grow very microscopically, and so most of the time what you're seeing is, is some visible structures, but really what's happening is underground, there's a lot more happening in the mold kingdom, and that's because they, they grow from usually a little spore in the center to produce these, what we call hyphae, these sort of massive branches. So they're a little bit like roots, except that they don't necessarily have to have any kind of fruiting structure like this. They can just be growing in the ground, and they're you know, pretty ubiquitous, pretty much all around us. Um, and then we have yeast. Yeast are also fungi, and they're single cell fungi, and they reproduce with a little bud like this and, and produce more of themselves. And both these things are really, you know, very prevalent everywhere around the world. And another thing that's important to bear in mind is that most molds reproduce using these little tiny spores, and these spores are easily dislodged into the environment and they go, they're like a seed, so they can go to grow a whole bunch of new fungi. And they're really important when it comes to indoor issues because they're often what's spreading the, the mold and also they may be responsible for how we respond to that mold. So, <coughs> here's a little trivia quiz. Who do you think fungi are closely related to? Are they closely related to animals or plants or other microorganisms like bacteria? Uh, anybody got any ideas? Yeah? Plants. Plants, yeah. So that's what we used to think, that they were very closely related to plants. And when I studied mycology and microbiology um, back in the 80s, uh, it, was, it was within a botany department. So we thought that they were basically like little lower, like little prehistoric versions of plants. But we actually know, <coughs> based on DNA work, that fungi are actually most closely related to animals. In fact, they are very much more close to animals than they are to plants, or and much further away from bacteria. So thanks for your response, and that's certainly the response I would have given as well, based on uh, what I knew about fungi from my undergrad days. But um, yeah, now we know that they're closely related to us. And that's really important because it means that we're kind of limited in the ways that we can kill fungi without actually harming us as well, us and other animals, because there aren't many good targets on a fungal cell that we don't share as well, whereas bacteria are a lot easier to kill than the fungi. So another important thing to think about fungi is how they eat their food, and this is very important because of it, it determines really how they grow and also what kind of damage that they do when they grow. So, you know, when we eat food, we take it in through our mouths, it goes into our stomachs, and then we absorb the nutrients, and we call that whole process digestion. But the fungi are different. So the fungi actually don't have stomachs, and what they do is they secrete enzymes into the environment, and those enzymes then break down the environment, and, and that brings the nutrients back into the fungus. And we call that, uh, and, and that also can cause 
substantial damage. And that's why when fungi grow on surfaces, like if they grow on leather or if they grow on wood or other things, you'll notice that they leave behind damage. So you can clean the fungus off, but the surface will still look damaged. And that's because they're breaking down that structure. We call that absorptive nutrition. So quite a different way of eating. So we, we ingest our food and then we digest, but the fungi digest their food and then they ingest it. So, like I said, I work on fungal infections, mostly, um, and fungi can infect us in different ways. And I just wanted to run through this, because this is kind of important when it comes to indoor fungi as well, because some of them can cause pretty hor horrible infections. So fungi can infect us superficially, and they can infect our skin and our hair, and things like ringworm, tunia, dandruff, those things are actually caused by superficial fungal infections. Or they can invade a bit deeper, but not really getting much deeper than the skin. And we call these subcutaneous infections. And these can be really nasty, sort of difficult to resolve infections. But the worst is if they actually disseminate around our body so they can get into our blood. Uh, that we normally, they normally start in the lungs, we inhale them, they can get out of the lungs into the blood and then they can travel to different organs. And that's when they get really nasty. But most fun, you can't do this. So, there's, there's probably a couple of million different species of fungi out there and only a small handful can actually grow in our bodies. And that's because most fungi can't grow at elevated temperatures, 37 and above, um, and they, will, they also just don't have the features that allow them to live inside a, a person's body. So there's only a small bunch that can do this. Um, a few can do this and, and a few more can live on that surface. But most of the time they don't cause us any harm. So most of the time we're interacting with fungi in the environment. There's millions of them out there. We're breathing them in. We're walking through them. You know, we're touching them. They're not causing us any troubles. However, there are also some issues with what we call non-infectious illnesses. So that's when they're not actually growing in or on our bodies, but we are interacting with them and they're causing us some diseases and some specific symptoms. So that can be things like hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, where we get sensitized to the fungus and then we have maybe trouble breathing after we're sensitized. We can have allergies to fungal uh, parts. Sometimes the fungi can actually start to grow in our sinuses and cause us sinusitis, which I suppose is sort of infectious, but, it, but we can't pass it from person to person. Um, sometimes fungi are, are implicated in asthma, and fungi are implicated definitely quite strongly in what we call sick building syndrome. That's where the, the importance of indoor organisms comes in, is that fungi can make us feel ill if we go into a building that has some kind of growth of fungi inside it. So this is a bit of science, um, which I'm sure is probably way too detailed for, you, for most of you to really want to know, but I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about the actual molds that cause the most issues because most molds don't. So most molds, um, in, certainly in the outdoor environment, don't cause us much problems. But the problem is that fungi can get into our homes and some of them, just a relatively small number, can actually grow inside our homes. So these are the species of interest, things like Cladosporium, Alternaria, Mucor, Aspergillus, Penicillium, um, and they can actually reproduce in our homes. So you can see here Cladosporium, this is one of the most ubiquitous fungi around. It accounts for a large proportion of the fungi that we encounter. It's a black mold and it's very tough, so very hard to kill. But it's, not, it's more of a problem in the environment in an allergy sense. It doesn't, it very uncommonly causes any form of infection. Penicillium you've probably seen on your fruit and vegetables. It's used to, to ripen cheese. Um, some species are used for that but it causes a lot of rot, but it doesn't cause any infection because it doesn't like to grow above about 20 degrees. Aspergillus is a very common indoor fungus. It's really an amazing, well-adapted fungus. It can grow in the soil, it can grow on plants, and it can also grow on animals and people. And it reproduces by making it just enormous numbers of spores. So it gets into the environment very easily. And actually, if you've ever turned over compost and seen what looks like a puff of smoke come out of that compost, that's actually all fungal spores. Um, and the genus, uh, the species that causes that is called Fumigatus, with fumi meaning smoke. So it looks like smoke, and you can get lots of it in the environment. 
but you, you've probably done that and it hasn't caused you any trouble because we are highly resistant to these fungi. Mucoidus is a bread mold type fungus, grows really fast. So if you've got it on an agar plate, it can cover that plate in just a day, growing really fast and also makes lots of spores. Sorry, my, <laughs> my computer's dinging. Uh, and finally, Alternaria um, is, a, is a black mold and it's very allergenic. So some of these are, are allergenic, they can cause allergy reactions. Some of them can actually cause infections in immunocompromised people, and some can cause superficial infections as well. So I think this is important to bear in mind is that these fungi, if they're in our homes, they can cause us symptoms, of sneezing, wheezing, unpleasant symptoms, but some can also cause more serious issues if we are immunosuppressed. So really, you don't want them in your home. So why do they grow so well inside? Well, many of these fungi can grow on just an enormous range of different materials. So fungi can actually grow on just about anything. There's almost nothing that they can't live and grow on. I think one of the few things is styrofoam, but there's almost nothing um, that they can't live and grow on. So they can grow in lots of things that we find inside, like paper products, wood, glues, carpets, and they can just grow in dust. So dust is usually composed of bits of skin, bits of dirt, etc. And the fungi are quite happy to grow on that. So that means it's pretty hard to control their food sources. We can't actually create an environment that's pleasant for us, that is unpleasant for the fungi generally. In terms of their food at least. Now this is what fungi look like when they're growing. So remember I said that they produce these hyphae and those are the things that grow down into the substrate and that's where they get their nutrients from and then they take those and they produce their spores which are their reproductive units. So that's what they can use to make more fungus. But in doing so, they can release various things. So they can release what we call MVOX, microbiological volatile organic compounds and these are gaseous compounds and these are what you smell. So if you go into a place that smells musty or fungusy, that's because of those volatile organic compounds. So we don't really know too much about how they're linked to health. And it's a bit like saying smoking causes cancer. It's very difficult to really get a strong link between a, a given cause and the effect in people because we can't actually test that. So we can't, you know, we can't give people cigarettes and say, smoke these and let's follow you over time and we'll see if you get cancer. And likewise, you can't give people in the box and see, take these and we'll smell these, we'll see how you go over time. Um, you can't do those kinds of unethical experiments. But there's growing evidence to support the idea that they probably have immunotoxic and neurotoxic um, effects on people and animals. So those are volatiles, they're what you smell. And then they, they can also release these spores and bits of cellular debris. And these can be very tiny and they can be very easily airborne and waft through the environment very, very easily. And these are the things that cause allergies. So these can give, up, give people various kind of flu, cold-like symptoms, itchy eyes, runny nose, etc. But people are very different in how they develop these symptoms. So one person might feel terrible walking into a, a mouldy building and another person doesn't notice it. So just because um, some people don't notice it doesn't mean it's not there. Yes. Can I ask um, um, the 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 uh, some um, spores uh, create uh, goodness? So spores can as, be open. as opposed to badness. Yeah, yeah. So spores in the outdoor environment produced by things like mushrooms um, and mold and fungi growing on trees and things. They can be fine for us, and in fact, yeah, if our homes and our environments are too sterile, we think that that's also linked to problems. Um, so if you grow up in a really sterile environment, your immune system doesn't respond appropriately. So yes, definitely, that's a great question. A, a lot of, of the outdoor environment, uh, molds in the outdoor environment are very good for us in the sense that they help us develop our immunity directly. Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, I guess the problem is when there are these particular species that are allergenic, so, and not all molds are, um, just right. these, these ones that I talked about on the previous slide, that's when we get problems. Um, and not always, but sometimes. 
Um, and then some of these molds can actually make toxins. So they can produce little toxic molecules. They're a bit too big to be volatile, so they're different to the M-box, um, but they can be carried around in the environment on dust and debris. Um, so there's some um, suspicions that they might be linked to health effects, but that's, again, we haven't really got so strong evidence So just to sum up what the health effects are, uh, just there's a couple of quotes here from a recent paper, which at first they said, there's credible scientific evidence to support the association between moisture damage, visible fungal growth measured indoors, and adverse health effects. So basically, you see moisture, you see mold, and chances are people are going to show some symptoms. And the World Health Organization said approximately 25% of residents in social housing stocks are prone to experience elevated health risks just because of this exposure. So that's a lot of people. Um, and it's, it's increased in social, uh, low socioeconomic situations uh, because of the problems of you know, adequate uh, maintenance, adequate ventilation, and various issues that come with social housing. But any house, my house included, um, if there's enough moisture, you can get molds growing. In your house. So, so if if uh, my, I noticed my leather belts are sort of covered yeah. in in, in yeah. mold, so does that mean does that mean that uh, I have a problem? Yeah, you know, in my in my flat. Well, yeah, I mean, leather is really susceptible. Yeah, so I've also noticed my leather bags and things have had mold spots growing on them. So, I mean, we'll talk about remediation in a little while, but yeah, on the whole, you want to get rid of that mold. Yeah. yeah because, because that mold, if you can see it, then it's probably giving off those volatiles, and it's also probably shedding spores, and it might be seeding the mold into the environment further. So anything uh, that where you can see visible mold, you want to clean it up. Okay. Yeah, leather's not too bad, as we'll talk about with the clean it. Could I, from a, a technical point of view, the your image is very dark. Can I turn on a light? Oh. Would that be a, No, I'll do it. Is that. Yeah, all right. I'll just test I, it. I Sorry, to interrupt. This one over here? Oh, it's definitely. Can you see? No, it's a light up that way. No, that one's not the light. What's the, is there a switch? I don't know. I think I've heard that. Yeah, the fire so, is that is that right or is it now glaring on the screen? No, I think that's better. Okay, yeah. Before you were a silhouette on in on the screen here. So. <laughs> so this is what I think. Because uh, people often ask, you know, at what point is there a problem? And personally, I think if you can see or even smell any mold in your house, then you've got a problem. You need to try and fix it. Um, and that might just be a, a minor fix, you know, a bit of cleaning, or it might be a more major fix if there's a lot of mold there. So, social housing. the best thing that you can do for moulds is to prevent them from growing in the first place. So we can remediate stuff, but you know, there's, there's, they'll always grow back uh, if you do remediation only. So the best thing to do is try and prevent growth. And you can do that by preventing moisture because moulds need moisture to grow. Um, and they also need a certain range of temperature, although their range of, of Acceptable temperatures is quite wide, and some of those molds that I talked about earlier, like penicillium, grows at a lower temperature, others grow at higher temperatures. So it's pretty hard to find a temperature that's comfortable for people where the molds can't grow. But we can do things about water. So this, this graph just shows the rate of molds, their growth in millimeters per day. So this one is two and a half millimeters a day, this one's two, etc., getting smaller. And they get smaller as the humidity goes down. So Below about 70% humidity, we're not getting any growth in the molds. But you can see the temperature range is really wide, so the, the sort of temperatures that we'd like to live at, you can get a fair bit of mold. And so molds need that moisture, and of course moisture can be due to things like flooding, and condensation, or just high humidity, and you know we've seen a lot of that with the floods and the, the rain that we've seen up until recently. So I know my house had I don't know, probably 80% humidity in it for quite a while. So, and I definitely got some molds growing in the house, which I've never seen before. 
So we can try and reduce this. We can try, obviously, when I need to fix any leaks, we can try and keep condensation down to a minimum. Um, and we can try and improve ventilation, but sometimes ventilation doesn't help if it's just as damp outside as it is inside. It doesn't really help that much. But trying to remove the air around can certainly help. So fans can help. And dehumidifiers can help as well as those sort of drying agents. So you might have seen you can buy crystals and things like that that will absorb moisture out of the air. But it can be hard. You know, I think we've all found in the last, over the last summer to autumn, it being really hard to keep the moisture down. Can I ask about the tropics? Yeah, so the tropics are hard for more. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. So uh, if you've ever travelled into the tropical areas, and I've spent a bit of time in Vietnam, and you just see mould and mildew everywhere on the outside. Right. And, and everywhere. But I guess in a lot of those areas, um, their houses are well ventilated. So... Sorry, good night. It's all right. Sorry. Thank you. No worries. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Hello. 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 But then the molds, the moisture levels inside the houses can can get greater as well. But yeah, we can get molds really in any pretty much any environment, except for perhaps the really dry environments like Antarctica. Um, but uh, otherwise, they tend to be an issue in the in the cold or in the hot climates. So you probably all want to know: Well, if I've got mold, what do I do about it? How do I clean it up? So if the mold is on a non-porous material, so it's growing on painted surfaces or your tiles or hard plastics, those are easy to clean. It's when it's somewhat porous that it can be more difficult. So if it's only semi-porous like wood or leather or concrete, these can be cleaned up without too much difficult, difficulty. But if it's a soft porous material, things like ceiling tiles, wallboards, carpets, mattresses, then you might have to throw it away. Um, because those things can be really hard to get the, the mold out of. Um, you know, and often the mold has, if it's, if it's causing a, a significant amount of mold growth, then it's probably also damaged those things structurally as well. And a lot of fabrics and textiles, these can be clean, but you might still end up with those horrible mildew mold black stains that are really, really impossible to remove. So there's lots of things out there on the market that say that they can clean molds. Um, and there's lots of anecdotes out there about what works best. Um, and I gave a few interviews um, at the time when there was lots of flooding about what works best. Um, and it was interesting to, to hear the opinions of different people. And as I said, there's a lot of talk out there, but scientific evidence is kind of quite scant, actually, in terms of what's the best Thing for mold. So is it best just to use soapy water? These products, like these mold pillars, they tend to have bleaches in them. Vinegar, is that good? Or, or some of these sort of natural things like tea tree oil or oil of clove. There's quite a lot of talk about those and their effects. I'm just going to run through the, these different things and get you to think a bit about like what might be the best. So soapy water is cheap and non-toxic. Um, and it actually is one of the best things to use, but it does require physical cleaning. So it requires good old fashioned elbow grease. You've got to scrub the surface. Um, and the problem with it is that while you can remove the stuff from the surface, it may not be penetrating enough to really kill the, the molds that are perhaps with the high heat going a bit more deep inside. So it's very good for surface contamination. And it will, because, um, because soap has sort of uh, cleansing agents in it, it will break down the molds and clean them quite well. Now what about bleach? So bleach, as I said, is an active ingredient in a lot of these mold removers. But the problem with bleach is it, it actually doesn't penetrate very well into porous substrates. So bleach is composed of, of the bleach active ingredient and usually quite a bit of water. 
And what usually happens is that the water will penetrate, but the bleach ingredient will stay outside of the porous substrate. So it'll look like it's made things better. It'll kill stuff on the surface, but it's not getting inside and killing the tyke that have penetrated further down. And the other problem with it is it gives off toxic gases. And so if you've ever used bleach, you'll know that it stinks. It's toxic, it's nasty, and you don't really want to be introducing more pollution into your indoor environment. And a third issue with um, bleach, which I, I forgot to write there, is that it does go off over time as well. It, that's because it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and that actually breaks down the bleach agent over time. So it's usually only got a, these things are usually only got a shelf life of about six months, and by the time you buy them, they might already be not that useful. What about vinegar? So vinegar is often pr promoted as a good way to get rid of molds. And it gets rid of molds because it's acidic. So it's very cheap. You can buy a bottle like this for less than $2. It's non-toxic. It's a food. After all, we can eat it. Um, although I don't recommend using any of the ones that are used in the kitchen. You can buy white vinegar from the supermarket or from hardware stores. That's appropriate for cleaning. And it's good, it can kill about 80% of fungal species that have been tested. And I want to say again that a lot of extensive tests haven't been done. So the problem is it doesn't kill everything. So you might find that your particular mold issue is not actually remediated by vinegar because you might be working with a mold that it doesn't kill. Um, and of course it's acidic, so it can damage some substrates. You have to be a bit careful when you use it. Tea tree oil, there's some evidence out there that it can effectively kill some problematic species. But there's not a lot, of, again, there's not a lot of published work on it. Um, in fact, there's only one paper that I could find that's really done a proper study. And it only looked at two different fungal species and killed them both, which was good, but you know, there's others that uh, haven't been looked at. So I can't guarantee that it would work. Um, and it's pretty expensive too, because they seem to be using it at 100%. And a little bottle like this, a 100 ml bottle, costs about $30. So you can quite, quite quickly go through that if you have a mold problem. Hydrogen peroxide, it works a little bit like bleach, but it's not as nasty as bleach. And it uh, works in a, in a similar way, it's very cheap as well. It, uh, just like bleach, it can also damage some surfaces, and it can actually combine with things to cause some potentially harmful secondary compounds. So even combining with those MVOX, those mo um, volatile compounds, it can potentially cause these harmful secondary compounds. But you know, there's not, again, a lot of data about it, but it's quite effective. And finally, oil of clove. This one came off a lot. So a lot of people talked about this during the floods as oil of clove being a good thing to use. I had to admit I hadn't really ever tried it. And when I looked around, I couldn't actually find any published evidence of it working really well. Uh, so it seems like there's a lot of talk out there that it works well, and perhaps people have tried it in their homes and it seems to work. But it might just be working because they're scrubbing hard, you know, and using good old-fashioned elbow grease to clean it up. And it can itself also be allergenic and it can also be quite expensive to use. So I don't know, the, I think the jury's out on, on mm -hmm. the oil of clove. So I had a look at some guidelines and there were some guidelines published now, it's like 17 years ago, so it's a while ago, but I don't think they've probably changed too much. So this is what the Australian Mold Guidelines said. So they said, Try to find something that will cause the least amount of dust because you don't want to be disturbing the mold and liberating it into the environment, just causing, making things worse. It shouldn't introduce further toxins. You, know, you don't want to get rid of the mold but replace it with some other toxin in your environment. And it should limit exposure, worker exposure. So they recommended vacuuming, with a, but vacuuming with a, something with a HEPA filter, so a high filtration filter that will actually catch the spores and the fragments and not just pump them back out into the environment. They recommended some liquid-based methods, such as detergent, as we've talked about, vinegar solution, also alcohol solution. Um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced with, about the use of alcohol. They also recommended steam cleaning or high-pressure washing for uh, the appropriate 
situation. Not every situation will be appropriate for high pressure washing. But they didn't recommend those chemical based methods. So they didn't recommend um, antimicrobial agents or biocides. They didn't recommend bleach. They didn't recommend 100% alcohol, but perhaps more diluted. Quaternary ammonia compounds, these are often used in hospitals, they didn't recommend those, formaldehyde. They said, don't use any of those, you've just introduced further toxic pollution into your environment. And some of them don't even work, so they don't necessarily remove the contamination problem. So that's what I came up with in terms of what I would recommend, what I would not recommend, and where I'm sitting on the fence and don't. I think we need further data to really say whether it would work or not. So soapy water, good old fashioned soapy water, very good for cleaning things up. And white vinegar as well, uh, very good for penetrating and, and killing the mold a bit more effectively. Don't use those bleached agents. They not only don't they work, they'll probably damage things and you'll have, be left with that horrible bleach smell. And these other things, you can try them. There's no harm in trying them. They're not really that toxic, um, but they may not work. It's up to you whether you want to try them or not. Um, and they might leave your house smelling a bit weird, you know, clothes. <laughs> so this is what I would recommend. So I do soapy water, which just means use soapy water and scrub it, scrub the mold off, um, clean the cloth, maybe throw the cloth away at the end. Or if you want something a bit more high powered, use white vinegar. Um, there's a couple of do's and don'ts with white vinegar. So you can use it on drywall, you can use it on leather, you can use it on tiles and wood and most sealed surfaces, but you can't use it on stone or marble because it's acidic, so it will etch that. It's not good for varnished wood because it seems that this acid can break down the varnish. Um, it's not recommended for any kind of metals like stainless steel or copper because it will actually cause those to oxidize and they'll get damaged and, and the you know, stainless will rust will go um, green. Um, the other thing you shouldn't do is add things to it. So just use the vinegar on its own. You don't use other agents like detergent. Detergent will actually reduce the effectiveness and other things added to it can produce harmful volatiles. And what you absolutely should never do is mix it with bleach uh, because that can really cause potentially dangerous um, volatiles to be produced. So this is the instructions. So first of all, open a window if you can, put on your protective gear, put the vinegar into a spray bottle. Now, vinegar varies in terms of its concentration. So, some, it's, so it's a good idea to have a look on the label to see how much acid it's got in it. They're usually around 5%, but some are higher. So you want to have a look at that and you want to dilute it down to, to 5% or less, particularly if you're working on a, on a surface that you might be worried that could damage. Um, put it in a spray bottle and spray it on the moldy surface and then leave it to sit for an hour and that will allow it to penetrate in and, and do its job. And then brush it with a um, soft bristle brush to, to get the mold off. And then wipe it over with a rag, wipe it again with a clean rag, um, uh, or a clean damp rag and then dry it, dry the area. Um, you want the area to be as dry as possible obviously because the last thing we want is more mold to come back because you've made it a little bit wet. But don't worry about the wetness of the vinegar because the vinegar is doing its job. So that wetness is okay, but just don't add a lot of water after that. Throw away the rag, um, thoroughly rinse the brush, or maybe throw it away as well if it, if it looks moldy and nasty. Because those things, you, if they've got living spores left in them and you use them again, then you might actually reintroduce the fungus back into your environment. So this is a way to clean things up, but but just bear in mind that the mold will grow back if you've still got moisture around. So you've also got to be thinking about how can I prevent the molds in the first place, as well as cleaning up any issues that you've got. So that's it. Uh, that's it from my formal presentation, but I'm really happy to answer any questions that you might have. About. Yeah. Yes. Can I ask, uh, uh, a question about heat and uh, draft, mm -hmm. uh, whether they cause mould. Uh, um, um, difficulty in 
putting the question. Uh, um, because we, uh, in the winter, um, we put on the heat. Right, yes. And uh, we don't open the windows. Well, I think if you put the heat on but your environment's dry, then it's fine. So remember that combination of, of heat and moisture can be the problem. But as long as your indoor environment is dry, so the humidity is under 70%, then the heat's fine. And in fact, quite a few fungi grow better in the colder climate than the warmer climate. So a bit of heat should help. It should help dry things out and it should help limit some of the growth of some of the fungi. But, yeah. um, but some of those fungi can grow at really high temperatures, like aspergillus can grow up to 60 degrees, so it won't prevent the growth of all of them. Um, but it's really the dryness that's really critical. When you say a soft bristle brush, do you mean a toothbrush or do you mean something as well? Uh, it depends on the area, size of the area you're dealing with, really. So if it's a bigger area, you know, toothbrush is going to be too small. Um, you can get sort of not quite nice uh, soft brushes from a hardware store that aren't too, you know, some, some of them have really tough plastic bristles, but some of them have softer bristles. Or um, those coconut uh, scrubbers that you can get these days as well, they're quite nice. They're not as tough as the, the plastic bristles. And that, but that's really just to protect your surfaces. So that's not, it doesn't really make it better or worse for the mold. It's really so that you don't damage the surface. Because um, if you start to damage a surface like a painted surface and you crack and, and um, scratch that surface, you're actually potentially causing more issues down the track because you might actually, the mold might actually be able to get into those cracks. So you just want to make sure that you don't damage your, your surface as well. Uh, and in, in our flat, we, um, <clears throat> I noticed that in, um, on a cold morning, the inside of the glass is absolutely dripping with uh, the, right, yeah. Um, yeah. moisture and um, I just wonder if that's the origin of the moisture in the, in the room. Yeah, correct. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um, I mean, you can't, that's a sort of a, a scientific, another, it's a natural thing that you have cold glass and then it meets. Exactly. Yeah, so but I guess, I mean, you get condensation because, because of the cold, but also because there's a relatively high level of moisture in the room to start with. So although the condensation is telling you you've got water in the room, that's a problem. It's also telling you you've got moisture in the air, and that yeah. could also be a problem. So if you can crack your, your window open a little bit, maybe just to let the moisture out for the night, um, or use a dehumidifier, that will help keep that going. Oh, well, that was my next question that, um, uh, for an individual um, here to buy a humidifier might be a little bit over the top. Mm. I was just wondering, uh, I mean, this might sound like a, a loaded question for Anglicare, but would it be um, a good policy on their behalf if they bought one for the unit? There's sort of 40 units here. Oh, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on, on Mondays, it could be uh, 30, flat 39's <laughs> turn, and then an another day it could be somebody else, and it just yeah, travels yeah, around, around the unit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would that be a, a, a technique, or? Uh, it's certainly worth a try. I, c I couldn't guarantee that it would work, that you, you, may know, you may need to run it every day to get the moisture down, rather than once a week. Um, so I'm not really sure. But you can also buy those granules at hardware stores that will absorb moisture. And that's a cheaper and easier, potentially easier way to get We've bought, we've, we have bought two bags of those. Mm. Mm. Yeah. They're about this size. So yeah, and they go into a little bucket with holes at the bottom and the moisture drips out at the bottom. So no, it's, it's, it's like those bags, you know, when you get sort of a piece of, electronic equipment and they... Oh, like a silica gel? <laughs> yeah. Sort of thing. yeah. It's like that stuff. Oh, okay. Do you, do you then dry those out in the oven? They said put them outside for 
24 hours in the sun. And oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Once a month. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you find they work? Oh, we've only had them for a short time, but uh, yeah. we haven't really... I guess there's various, you know, different things out there. And you mentioned soapy water. Um, can I just ask what kind of soap and what temperature the water? Because, I mean, that seems to me the most natural. And like, we've yeah. got some mould on mm -hmm. curtain, mm -hmm. and that's the sort of thing I would like to use. Mm -hmm. But what sort of soap? So just um, d just dishwashing detergent would be good mm. enough. Yeah. And but does the temperature make a difference? Um, I would use warm water mostly just because it's more pleasant to work with. Uh -huh. <laughs> but do wear gloves as well because the moulds can be you know not that nice to handle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's a, that's an easy way to start. And if you find that maybe the detergent isn't strong enough, you could then use stronger detergent like a um, I, I quite often use dishwasher, like dishwasher, machine dishwasher detergent because yeah. it, it's quite strong. Uh -huh. um, so a little bit of that can, can work as well. Or washing soda is also good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank but you. yeah, there's various different ones, you know, and they get sort of stronger and more and more alkaline as you mm -hmm. go up the scale. And again, you've got to kind of bear in mind, you know, how bad is your problem and also how precious is your substrate, you know, because you don't want to damage that. So they yeah. sort of start with a milder. Um, version and then work your way up to, to see if you can get it to work. Mm -hmm. But always test a small bit at first because you don't want to, you know, if it's a precious thing like a leather couch or something, you don't want to damage the surface of that um, and end up with the worst situation on your hand mm -hmm. when you start mm -hmm. off with. Mm -hmm. um, if you just further on that, uh, what about sprays like Windex? Uh, Windex is not really, I mean, it's not an anti mold thing. No. So it will it will certainly help clean the surface. Um, and yes, I for example I've had some spots of mold on glass on the inside of the glass in my house, and I've just used that to clean clean the mold off that because I know that it hasn't penetrated into the glass. It's just grown there on the surface. So it's fine for things like that, but it's but it's acting like a detergent rather than like a vinegar. So it's not going to penetrate and kill stuff that's on perhaps leather or wood or something like that but yeah it's good for those um, solid sources mm. thank you oh, oh, just a point that the person who designed this these buildings this building Noel Bell and he was very careful to make there was four ways of um, cross ventilation mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's quite unique um, I, I, I would imagine that Cross ventilation is a very big factor. Mm. The real uh, problem with it is not having hot water radiators under the windows, which you have in many other parts of the world, and having these air conditioners on the on the mountain on the wall means that people keep the windows shut. Oh right, yeah. Which is a it's a it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a situation which. matter of giving up some of the so-called work from the mm. in order to get the cross ventilation. Mm. I guess I mean I guess you want to think about when's the time the best time to open the window um, mm. versus when's the best time to keep the window shut and you keep your room warm. So you might want to keep things shut and warm during the day and then at night when you're going to bed open the window to let some the air out and yeah. get some ventilation then uh, yes because you don't want to be opening the windows with the heater on you know and just letting all the air out well, we pop water regulators of course you can have the windows open um, in a consistent but when you're circulating air i mean bell's principle is sort of undone um, right Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, I guess any, I mean, any solution is, is try, tries to be optimal for the situation in which it's put in. So, you know, traditionally in Sydney, we haven't really had a mobile problem in the winter. It's really been a problem in the summer when it's gotten hot and humid. Um, but what we're seeing now with this sort of wet, humid, cold, humid 
conditions requires a slightly different approach, which we, the way that our buildings are designed is not so good for that. Mm. Well, there's, a, there's plans for men to drive the air to summer. I, I doubt that they're going to be using them. I mean, we're going to be very long. So are people finding mold problems here in the flats? Mm. Are there problems in the on the walls or carpets? We've got, we got problems in the curtains and oh. um, some of our, anything that's black, you know, like this, this sort of thing gets covered in the mould. The textiles and things. Yeah. 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 And we've also, oh, I was telling you about the leather, mm. we had leather near the, mm. near the window, it, it got coated, coated in that green. Yeah. 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 Leather can be a big problem in cupboards and things where they, they're not well ventilated. Yeah. I, when I was younger, I, I worked in the tropics, and um, you know, the, the um, if you spilt something on, on your clothes and put your clothes away, mm -hmm. if you took, brought them out after a week, there would be this. Oh. <laughs> and um, so the the weather recently reminds me of Innisfail and which had, used to have about 300 inches of rain a year. All right. And um, so it, it's uh, s somewhat similar to... Yeah. yeah. You know, and there was often a constant, inside there was a constant smell of mould and, um. and paint, painting was a problem because you, to, to clean the surface before you painted it was, mm. was really... All right. You know, double or triple the work, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, it's a problem for many parts of the world. Yeah. But it's a but that's bad if you're putting it on your curtains, which does suggest that it's a condensation issue, and perhaps you need to keep your windows open a bit more. Yeah. For that. It, it seems to me maybe we could discuss with um, sort of Marilyn and others accessing some of these crystals which would help with uh, you know the level of humidity in our units seems to me a very simple one and maybe if management could uh, organize what's the best version of that and let us know and maybe even see if we could buy something in bulk if we had enough orders so we get it cheaper and then sort of all units who are interested, you know, could could get those crystals, and that might certainly help. Um, because obviously, it's also to the interests of Anglicare to make sure that the units are in a good state. You know, they, they don't want to have to sort of deal with deteriorating units, because then repair becomes more expensive, and we get into that kind of cycle. So, if we could intervene at least with the crystals, which seems to me, you know, that maybe the simplest way for everybody, yeah. um, that could be a start for people. And then obviously, if, you know, residents have really big problems, they'd have to go to one of the commercial companies to get people to come in and help if they can't manage themselves. Yeah, I know um, you can purchase like a brand called Dampweed at just at Coles. You get the, the bucket and the um the crystals, and then you can also buy either at Bunnings or Big W because I did this myself. Um, the bulk refill, like a um yeah, it's like about two liters or something. So that works out. Them rather than keep buying new um yeah um new crystals. original containers, they just keep refilling mine. So mm, yeah, um, that's that's really effective for me. And it's amazing, in a week or so, you've got this much water and you think, where's that come from? It's mm. just, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, um, I have more in my house. Well, <laughs> maybe we could get something on paper about those versions. Yeah, we could do that. And research. give that to, to everybody. Yeah, um, yeah. And then the sort of less mobile, you know, people like Dennis, who's good at running errands. Or down, uh, <laughs> could you know get a yeah. number if people want them? We could yeah. go and sort of do it like collectively, not every individual ha 
unit or sort of yeah. tenant having to manage on their own. Mm -hmm. If we do it together, it's going to be easier for us, I think. Mm -hmm. See how many people have, yeah, are interested. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, we get some prices and things and some ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That would be fantastic. Yeah, okay, all right. Have a hand. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 yeah.